Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 591. That is 591 of the Agostino Zynga show. I hope you are doing well wherever this blood clout podcast may be finding you. I hope you are doing well. If it's your first, now nah, I'm going to do that stuff. You know how it deal is. Um, it's been a while again. I've been chock a block with work. The days that I get off free, I'm doing more work outside of the stuff that I'm doing already. So it's been a bit crazy, but I'm glad to be back in the hot seat talking to you guys about all the cultural interesting things I found online that I want to comment on because that is the dear nature of podcasting. Number one thing to get started off on is a recap of my weekend. Because this weekend was the first weekend in a long, long time that I was DJing. I DJed this weekend, right? It's been a while. I've told you about my story. I've told you about my desire to become a professional DJ. I've told you that I don't want to be a professional DJ only. I want it to be part of something that I do. I want it to be one tentacle, one octopus tentacle of the many, many things that I do in life. And prior to the pandemic i was doing djing pretty often i was doing the djing i was a dj in a very consistent and often well in a very consistent way that i would say it was slowly but surely leading me up to be somewhat near the semi-professional level because i was playing from thursday to sunday sometimes friday to saturday every single weekend in a local bar or pub somewhere around you know again they're not nightclubs they're not amazing spaces but at least i was playing in front of people and then i also had the added advantage because i was well liked within a little community of playing in warehouse raves now in that warehouse rave community i don't really see them too much i don't hang around them too much and some of them probably don't like me anymore but when i was well liked i was always getting recommended to play in these warehouse parties in hackney wick but now that chance has already gone out the window. But out of the blue, I was able to go to um, the Brixton Jam in... Let me see, the Brixton Jam, the big, the big disco. Is it the big disco day night? I think that's what it's called, right? I was able to play the Brixton Jam one time for a night called... Yeah, I was able to play the Brixton Jam for like an open deck sort of situation. So I hadn't been to Brixton Jam ever in my life because, you know, it's in flipping Brixton and I basically avoid going anywhere near south london if you're not from london you know most people don't really leave their little locale of london so if you're from northwest east south you don't really leave your area and from traveling from east to south if you're gonna go clubbing if you stay out after 12 um you basically have to get an uber back home because it's a nightmare to get a bus home so it's always been a bit of a nightmare for me to go to but i played an open deck situation a couple of months ago i guess i've done a good job because i then got a text message randomly from brixton jam saying hey we'd like to you know have you back in to play like a paid gig for like a disco party we've got going on and end up playing it and end up having a really good time um, i played in the terrace which is basically on the outside for like two hours maybe let's say an hour and a half because they had to basically set things up again it wasn't the best setup in the world don't get me wrong but just being able to play in front of people playing in front of yeah playing in front of people on an actual real legit setup was always something that kind of brings joy to my heart and just the whole Think about it, right? Um, being at home, researching new tunes, crate digging, finding new songs, uploading or oh, sorry, drag and dropping them into your record box, arrange them into some sort of order that you want to play them into, arrange them into other little sub crates that you want to have some stuff for the future. Like loads of things. What I started getting ready, like you know, preparing my headphones, finding my little adapters to put into the mixer, and um, what outfit I'm going to wear. Should I go sober? Will I drink? Um, what shoes should I wear? What hat should I wear? Like all that stuff is really, really um, fun. And it really reminded me how much I miss DJing. I really do miss it, man. And I think for the most part, like most people post-pandemic, I've just kind of ignored the things that I can't do anymore. I've just kind of put them to the back of my head so I don't really get depressed or think about them too much. But sometimes when you get reminded of the things that you used to do pre-pandemic that were really fun or the people that you used to see and stuff, it kind of does bum you out a bit. And I'm like, damn, man, one of the casualties of pandemic was definitely my you know i had a very long period of time during the pandemic where i was unemployed so my earning capabilities were really really diminished during that time and i'm really thankful i had this podcast because it was able to kind of tide me over before i found my job which i currently have which i'm happy to have as well um but then also another thing that kind of died by the wayside i wouldn't say my social circle because i didn't really have a big group group of friends really but Another thing that died by the wayside was definitely my DJ career. Um, it wasn't, don't get me wrong, I wasn't flipping going to turn into Carl Cox, you know, within a year. But I was going on a nice trajectory. Do you know what I mean? I was playing weekly. 
Um, I had the ability to go to different streaming platforms to go play. Like even yeah, I even had I sent out some emails to some couple of streaming platforms. Um, one of them in Berlin, another one here in London. And before the pandemic, it was looking pretty rosy for me to go. They were kind of replying and getting in contact. But then I guess when the pandemic hit, everybody and their mum wanted to go on the streaming platforms because it's a good platform to go basically and put your face out there and kind of keep your name hot. So then, you know, far better people who are maybe far more experienced than I am probably got the advantage to go there. And now they're probably inundated with requests. So those requests that I kind of went and kind of sent forward, I kind of died. I've not really got any replies back on those ones. So it's been a bit dark. It's been a bit sad. It's been a bit slow and shit. But again, you know, I'm thankful that I had some level of a career in it in the first place. And even if I do get the opportunity to play sets only here and there, that's kind of always been my plan anyway. I kind of always wanted to adopt the sort of Dixon model of playing like 100 dates a year, maybe like 50 to 60 at some key locations around the world, at some key park clubs, um, key festivals and whatnot, key events. And then for the rest of the time, do the stuff that I actually enjoy doing as well. On top of that, like podcasting and, you know, writing and taking for pictures and shit and obviously have an opportunity to kind of get paid for that stuff as well going forward. But I can't deny it. It was really, really fun to go and play. I played at this event here on screen. It's called the Big Disco Day Night Terrace Party with the illustrious backs. Unfortunately, one of my um, other casualties of this event was my flipping keys. Like an idiot, I lost my keys. I know how I lost them, actually. I thought about it now, and I actually figured it out as I was getting out of my Uber because I obviously prepared myself a little bit late, and I was a bit tight on time. But the funny thing about South London to East London communication-wise um, is that, not communication, I mean commuting-wise from East London to South, is that it takes the same amount of time to get public transport to South as it does to get on the Uber. But I just didn't want to jump from different lines and shit and get on the bus and all that stuff. So I just went to get there, you know, A to B and end up getting there about 50 minutes or so. But um, I ended up losing my keys and I ended up losing my keys because as I got out of Uber and I put my stuff in a little flower pot um, next to the bar to kind of get myself ready to go into the club, I must have left it in the flower pot. And then of course that then ended up being a little kind of... Um, What's that thing called? It set a momentum for me losing something else later on, which I'm not going to describe, but it just kind of pissed me off. But hey, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, the event itself was absolutely amazing. I had a really good time. I bumped into a couple of people that I played with beforehand at the Open Decks. That was nice to see. Um, exchange of text here and there. So I kept that little community going up. And who knows? Maybe this will be the start of relaunching my DJing career and allowing me to play more places because I do really enjoy it. As much as I would like to play more house, more techno stuff, um, Disco has always been my foundation. That has been always been the, the place where I kind of know best because I started playing, when I started getting into DJing first, which is what, 2010 or something like that. That's the first time, that's the first cool platform, or sorry, first genre I started to get into, um, especially when I was doing my club nights over in East London with my other partner that I used to work with a lot. And um, yeah, man, it was really fun. I had a lot of good, I had a, I, I had a lot of fun doing it and i can't wait to be back again doing the same thing going forward i really 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 cannot wait so that was a good time moving on what's happened over the weekend of course we have to discuss beyonce's renaissance album absolutely um amazing album i think it's actually i think it's really good to uh, well to see the two of the biggest artists in the in music you know in drake and beyonce both releasing similar type of records it obviously goes to show there's something in the water and then of course seeing what is happening with the guys over at kind of music who i've always been a fan of and just the stuff that i do in terms of going to see people like from the innovisions group who go and play and stuff it's clear to see that there's definitely been a change there's definitely been a a sea change something's happening out there where a lot of artists and stuff are starting to get into that kind of um you would call it atmospheric house, I'm a piano extension type of music. It's definitely something a lot of people are definitely getting down with. And it's good to see um, a lot of the biggest artists in music, especially with those ones who are kind of connected to hip hop and R&B, also exploring it because I've always felt like that kind of music would lend itself really well to that kind of genre anyway, sonically. Um, a lot of the melodies that they use, um, a lot of the lyrics that they use, because a lot of it is lyrical based, would kind of work well because I think a lot of dance music in general, they, it tends not to be lyric based. And a lot of dance music enthusiasts tend to not like lyrics as well. You go to places like Berlin, kind or go to places like Berlin in general and you'll see a lot of people leave the dance floor if a track comes in that's got a, too many vocals on it which is really bizarre but it's definitely a thing that I've seen a lot I know a lot of electronic music fans especially ones who are you know diehard techno fans don't really fuck too hard with the vocals and even some house heads don't fuck too hard with vocals so it's nice to see vocals in house coming back and it's just nice to see that kind of vibe um being presented on the highest level with an artist like Beyonce and for me personally um 
knowing that this is one of three albums supposedly because it's, it's, it's tied into like three acts this is act one is really really incredible because the level that this album is performing at the execution of it is absolutely incredible so to think that there's two more of these coming out later on is absolutely insane whether or not this will be like there'll be three different genres or this will just be a continuation of the sound or it's be interesting too will she do a hip-hop album will she do because i think a lot of people have been asking beyonce to rap more which is funny because you know you wouldn't expect that from beyonce but she's actually not too bad at rapping a lot of people would be wanting maybe a traditional r&b album from her maybe one people would want more pop maybe some people would want more disco type vibes because i feel like renaissance kind of delivered on all kind of factors it kind of gave us a good little blend of like disco and house maybe more so house kind of vibes with it but overall the really striking part of it that i really really like about it two things actually that are striking number one how it's basically sequence reminds me a lot of DJ kicks. So I'm not too sure if that's kind of what they got the inspiration off of, but most kind of like mix albums within the dance music industry for the most part are usually mixed, right? There's usually transitions and usually you can buy an album that's separating tracks with the mixes. You can buy an album that's separating tracks without the mixes and you can buy an album that's just the mix, like basically an hour, 20, whatever minute long of DJ mixing the tracks together of whoever artist it is. And sometimes there's an artist who puts their own tracks on there. Sometimes there's an artist who picks out tracks that kind of, you know, resonate with them and kind of tell the story about their career and whatnot. But I felt like how they put this together, this album, and they mixed it all in, really kind of elevated the sound and gave people and gave people an ability to maybe give it a chance because I feel like if it was just tracks if it was just a five minute house track I don't think people would have given it the chance they probably should have given it I think they would have kind of gotten a bit off of it especially when it comes to the black community I would assume because a lot, a lot of them reacted quite negatively to the Drake album maybe for the similar reason I'm not sure if I'm just a stretch there but I, would, I think that would have been um, a case but I really liked how it was because I liked how it all flowed into the other and it really kind of lifted the tracks as they come along then secondly, the other option I want to talk about is absolutely the track Break My Soul, the title track. When Break My Soul dropped, um, I was one of the biggest critics because I felt at the time, if I'm not mistaken, Break My Soul dropped around the same time Drake's, um, what you call it? What's the album called? Uh, Drake's album, ba, 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 go on here. What's it bloody called? I felt like Break My Soul dropped the same time that Drake's album honestly never mind dropped and I remember thinking to myself Break My Soul isn't any better than any of the tracks on honestly never mind I thought like they were probably on the same sort of level um, but then a lot of people were like no Break My Soul is better and I felt like there's a lot of standum included in it and it's no surprise really because you know Drake and Beyonce have ridiculous stands who kind of can't be objective I think maybe more so Beyonce fans Drake fans are quite critical and quite harsh when it comes to his music but I feel like a lot of the you know Beyonce stand especially on Twitter are really really delusional and they are unable to be rational when it comes to Beyonce and I feel like a lot of them were criticizing um were overly criticizing Drake and not really having the same energy with Break My Soul now I have to take it all back now because Break My Soul in sequence sounds absolutely phenomenal. You, you could, it could be argued. You could argue that Break My Soul might be the number one standout track on the album because it lifts the entire album. Because it's very kind of, I feel like, I won't say dark, but it's got that kind of, that kind of like slow kind of vibe that you know, know well, you know well from like, you know, listening to people like Kind of Music play, right? I'm really, really hoping this didn't conk and stuff and my computer restarted itself for no reason, but we're going to continue. Anyway, yeah. So that slow drubbing sound that you used to hearing from Kind of Music, this type of affair, is, um, is something that, you know, you're used to kind of listening to that kind of thing when it comes to atmospheric house, deep house sort of tunes, right? This sort of vibe, right? But the good thing about the flipping Break My Soul is that it's completely electric. Like it's a, it's like, like um, it reminds me of like um, I don't know, a track from like what would you call it, Inner City or something, right? Those kind of classic house tracks that just get you off your seat and want you to maybe dance. It's just incredible how tunes change based on um how you listen to them, where you listen to them, and the sequence you listen to them in. That's why sometimes I repeat to myself like, if you're an artist. It could be argued that sometimes releasing albums could be detrimental to your whole album release anyway. So releasing singles could be detrimental to releasing the album because sometimes if a single comes out that doesn't necessarily tell the story of the entire album or tells a piece of the album, it may kind of throw people off in terms of listening to the whole entire thing and make them think that oh, it's one way when it's actually another way. 
And sometimes albums themselves or singles themselves only come to life when they actually listen to and played in sequence. Because I know for myself, I've been to many live shows where sometimes a track that I didn't actually like, I've heard a person perform it again on stage and I've actually started to fall in love with it again. I'm like, oh my God, I actually like this song. I didn't like it before listening to my headphones, but there's something about it that how they performed it live or the instrumentation or what I kind of listened to when I was just standing there live, it kind of changed how it kind of resonated to me. And I feel like Break My Soul did the same thing. When it came on, I instantly, because sometimes... I'm not the kind of person who just, usually, for me, when it comes to albums, I let them play all the way through. But if there's a single I really dislike, I'll skip it if it comes onto the album. But with this one, when it was flowing through and I heard Break My Soul, it immediately clicked. I was like, oh, now I get this single. This single is absolutely banging, like really, really good. And again, the album itself, in general, is overall really, really solid. Um, it sounds incredible. It's mixed amazing. And I think... It's sad and it's out of order if you're like some of the kids coming up and some of the younger artists and stuff because it's, what what these albums do is that they kind of reset everything because this isn't even a genre that everyone's competing in. Right? Only Drake and kind of Beyonce have basically released these two albums or maybe you say maybe Lizzo to some extent but hers was maybe a bit more disco-y. But for the most part, what it does, it resets everything and it also separates the weak from the, from the, weak from the strong because essentially this album is like mixed and mastered and put together better than anything you've heard and it kind of really shows up some of the other albums that come out that kind of feel like cash grabs that feel a bit rushed that feel a bit amateurish and that's the unfortunate side of him because i think a lot of this is basically money and experience and access like a lot of the people that beyonce has been able to pull like i'm just looking at the name of kind of people that um are being featured there honey d john um now rogers i'm seeing here beyonce pharrell williams jay-z like this is just this is just bloody money and access. Sometimes money and access allows you the internet is featured on here, like allows you the, the ability to kind of connect with people who most people don't have a chance to really connect with, and you know that's just unfortunate. But for Beyonce herself, the album is flipping amazing. I love all the pictures associated with some of the album itself. I love the fact that they've put in as much energy into the digital release as they put into the physical release with the pamphlets and Beyonce looking incredible in some of the outfits that she's wearing and stuff. Like, it looks absolutely phenomenal. Um, there's a video coming out that I've seen her film somewhere that looked really great. Everything about it, it just looks stunning, to be honest. And I can't wait to see more hip-hop artists and R&B artists decide to kind of dip their toes in this kind of field. Because I feel like another one is a good um, person who could do something like this is maybe um, Tory Lanez. I feel like Tory Lanez's album, Alone at like Prom, was severely under underlooked. One of the albums that I kind of really liked last year, I'm pretty sure it came out. Was it last year, Alone at Prom? I think it might be 2021. And I, funnily enough, actually, this DJ gig that I just played at, which I just mentioned on the podcast, I actually played a couple of tunes from that album and it fit really, really well. A lot of people were really surprised that it was Tory Lanez when they came and asked me about the tune idea and stuff. So I really recommend, I really would hope that Tory Lanez does Yeah, it came off, yeah, it was Alone at Prom, which was at um, 2021. Hopefully Tory Lanez could do something like that going forward. I did read recently on his twitter feed that he mentioned that the deluxe album of alone at prom will only come out later because he feels like he didn't get the attention that he should have got because of all the stuff he's got going on with the case at the moment so alone at prom will hopefully come out later on um when all that case stuff is kind of sorted so then he can have a full promo run with it with the deluxe side of it but that kind of um what would you call it i think alone at prom was more you might call it electro um i wouldn't say i wouldn't say indie dance but electro disco but in that kind of field but i can definitely see him doing a lot of kind of housey type stuff going forward but beyonce renaissance album is absolutely phenomenal most people would agree i think it's got stellar reviews again i don't read reviews i don't care what people say about the albums but to be honest from what i've been glancing at a lot of people had the same thing to say about it and i'm really excited to, to see what kind of comes comes forward off the back of this obviously the drama with Clay's was quite entertaining to see happen her response has been pretty brutal she essentially just took the reference and uh you know off on the track itself which is really funny but also shows the benefit of streaming nowadays is that you can just update uh, uh, albums on the go um you know based on what's kind of going on in culture or maybe you've kind of had a burst of inspiration or maybe you just thought you know what fuck this person who's kind of calling me out and making it seem like i need their fucking reference if anything i was doing them a favor i'm just going to take it off and eat all the money that is definitely something that i like to see as well going forward but in general beyonce's racist album is absolutely phenomenal if you haven't checked it out already please do it's really really good work it's really really good work and of course moving on from that we have to talk about the main man and that is cristiano ronaldo 
Um, he keeps um, causing us absolute nightmares as Man United fans. We can't seem to tell what's actually going on at the club. Is he staying? Is he going? No one actually knows. But this is a really big development from the club because it's it, effectively what it's done is that it's thrown the entire club under disrepute and it's also been a stark reminder that whatever we thought has changed with the reshuffle, with the hiring of John Murto to be the quasi-director of football, with Richard Arnold coming in and replacing Ed Woodward um, and everything else that's going on in the backroom staff and the boardroom level, essentially what I've always said from the day dot, until the Glazers go, we are never going to become a successful football club because we're not run by success. We're not run by serious football people, and this is definitely what it's been shown. Because United had a friendly match the other day against Real Vallecano, um, the team that Bebe, former United player, and Falcao play for. And during that game, Ronaldo played surprisingly because he hasn't trained that much and he's been kind of MIA on this whole like sickness leave thing going on you know he had something wrong with the family but effectively his agent's been shopping around to different clubs and no club is basically bit but he effectively had to come back finally to United he trained for a couple of times I think played against Rava kind of only for the first half because obviously he's not match fit and then at half time he left the stadium now at the time that this happened the brief in the club was that many other players did so and also that he was given permission and there's nothing wrong but a lot of fans were basically noticed that he kind of left the match, you know, at half time because a lot of the fans were waiting outside the stadium. He obviously stopped to give, you know, autographs, take pictures, which was nice for him to do. He didn't just storm off. But still, having a player as senior as Ronaldo decide to leave at half time is definitely not good for the club morale. It's definitely not good for the club unity and definitely not good for the new manager, Eric Ten Hag, if he wants to try to bring the dressing room together. And considering all the issues that we've had with prior managers, with prior regimes, it just doesn't seem like this is going to be helpful to what Ten Hag is trying to do at this club. And I feel like now there needs to come a strong decision from up above, whether it's from the board in terms of enabling and giving Ten Hag the authority and the ability to say, hey, Ronaldo, you're not in my plans until you commit to this club. Or um, it gives them the ability to maybe just rush this transfer forward and basically get him out of the club as soon as possible. Because I feel like having him around the players now, considering what Eric Tanak is trying to do and trying to get the club back to where it needs to be and trying to build a good kind of club morale isn't beneficial. He's too experienced, he's too old um, of a player to have you know around the squad, on the bench, not playing. So the best thing to do would be to kind of send him to the youth team, let him train there, or just basically have him on ice until he gets a transfer out of the club because this isn't going to end well. It really isn't. And again, like I said beforehand, this also proves that the reshuffle that we did with the boardroom members and the hiring of John Murto and the promoting of you know Richard Arnold from inside and them saying that Richard Arnold is nothing like Ed Woodward and da 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 da. This is not true. The same issues that we had under Ed Woodward's regime are still persisting and basically goes to show that effectively the, the Glazers' ownership, we are unable to run like a football football club because I don't think this will happen at any other proper football club. They wouldn't have a player like Ronaldo essentially dictating what the club does in terms of trying to sign players, in terms of trying to convince him to stay, in terms of bending over backwards to do anything for him. Proper football clubs wouldn't do it. They'd look at it coldly. They'd look at it almost um, methodically and just make a decision um, in terms of business, in terms of football, in terms of success and ability to win trophies, what makes more sense? And having an ageing 37-year-old Ronaldo up front leading the line for this club, considering where we want to go, probably isn't a smart decision. But if you are going to have him, he has to commit and be on board with what Eric Ten Hag is going to do and basically be under the, you know, be under the idea or be be okay with the idea that Eric Ten Hag is running the ship and it's not Ronaldo's show anymore at all. He's not the biggest player at the club. So he's not the biggest person at the club. The biggest person at the club should always be um, the manager going forward. And this uh, development here, courtesy of BBC Sport, basically clarifies that effectively what the club tried to tell us that it was okay for the players to leave at halftime wasn't exactly true. So it's a headline for BBC Sport. It says, Man United players, including Cristiano Ronaldo, criticised by Ericsson Hulk for leaving friendly early. I like how they specify that it's Man United players criticised. Yeah? Man United players, they've specified that clearly because I guess his, his team now don't want it to look like he's being um, disobedient or being a brat because that's not going to help his brand. It's also not going to help his ability to find a new club if he's kind of, you know, throwing his toys at the prime. So it's effectively, it continues the article. It says, Man United boss Eric Ten Hag says it's unacceptable that several players, including Cristiano Ronaldo, led the friendly on Old Trafford versus Rayo Vallecano right earlier. 
Ronaldo in his, Ronaldo in his first preseason game had been replaced at half time. He was pictured leaving with Diego Dallo, who had sat in the director's box with several players, all of whom left 10 minutes before the end. Okay, so Ronaldo left with Diego Dallo at half time, and the rest of them left 10 minutes before the end, which you're not meant to do. Think about it from your, your normal workplace. If you go for workplace drinks, you're not usually, I would say you're not allowed to leave, but you feel bad leaving after one drink sometimes. Or if you do leave, you have to leave on a French exit type of vibe and pretend you're going to the toilet. But for the most part, if you're with your work colleagues, you try and stay until maybe the first person leaves or something, right? But you try and be a little bit social. So you imagine even for a football club, if you're going to attend a game, you have to stay until the end. You, you know what I mean? Until you're basically dismissed, you stay. But there's no like leaving at half time or leaving 10 minutes before. It doesn't make any sort of sense. It continues. It says, we are a team and that means you stay until the end, said Ten Hag. It's unacceptable for all those involved. United drew the game 1-1 with Ronaldo, unable to make his, mar make his mark, to, unable to mark his return to action with a goal. The 37-year-old who returned to United last season um, has spells with Real Madrid and Juventus, is keen to move away from Old Trafford to pursue the desire to compete in Champions League and he is allowed to miss um, the Thailand tour and the Australian tour for personal reasons, but basically because he's a big-time player, which is really bad as well. Eight times as previously said, Ronaldo is not for sale and remains in our plans. New signing Eric Christian Eriksen and Sandra Martinez both featured um, for an hour against Rayo Vallecano in a game set up by Eric Ten Hag for the players who are not involved extensively in the Saturday's 1-0 defeat at Aleph Club Madrid in Oslo. United opened their 2022-2023 Premier League season at home to Brighton on Sunday the 7th of August which is coming up coming up this weekend so yeah personally for me if it was up to me i would cut my losses now and get rid of ronaldo i don't think we should be bending over backwards for a 37 year old ronaldo it doesn't make any sort of sense going forward if he has to stay we have to basically get him to commit to stay and also get him to agree that Ericsson Hag is boss and what he says basically goes and if that's the case then fair enough i'm happy to him to stay it's most likely not going to happen so if that's the case either freeze him out or get him out of the club in my opinion because i can't be doing with this bullshit i can't be dealing with this bullshit I also want to quickly talk about and mention this interesting story, um, courtesies of Photos for Ye, which has been spread by most people who are kind of, you know, within the Kanye universe and kind of, you know, Kanye stan accounts. But effectively, this is Kanye's response to somebody reaching out to him about Yeezy Day. I'm not sure if the person is known to Kanye. I'm not sure if the person just asked a random question about the stock concerning Yeezy Day. But effectively, Yeezy Day was something that's been promoted by Adidas. And I think it started from last year. And essentially, it's a day where Adidas Originals basically re-release or try to resell or basically get rid of dead stock Yeezy items such as slides or, you know, 700s or 350s or wave, whatever it may be called, right? Um, shoes concert within the kind of Yeezy brand um catalog unfortunately for me i was looking to buy some yeezy boots um especially some of the desert rat ones going going forward but the desert brown ones sorry, going forward but unfortunately i couldn't get a hold of those because there were days one on the list mostly i just saw a lot of wave runners a lot of 700s a lot of 350s a lot of 380s a lot of slides and that's about it and some foam runs but i didn't really see any um desert boots but it looks like a pretty good um way for a lot of yeezy fans to get a hold of stuff you might have missed out on um and maybe to get a hold of some og stuff that came out in in the back in the day like the i think it was um the turtle dove um 350s or whatever they were called right they were meant to come out again but again i wasn't able to get a pair because the site basically kept crashing by the time i was able to log on everything was sold out so that was out of my um purview but it's interesting interesting to see what Kanye has to say about yeezy day and a that's in general because effectively what we're basically seeing here is Kanye complaining about another corporation that he's working with which makes me get to the point where I'm like, if you keep complaining about everybody, sometimes just look in the mirror and think to yourself, is it maybe me? If it's always happening to you, it might end up being you in the end, right? It might not be end up being everyone's fault. That's kind of a common adage going forward. Sometimes it can be all your, it can be sometimes the other person's fault and you just kind of have severe, you're kind of one of the most severely unlucky people in the history of the world. But most of the time, it's usually an issue that concerns yourself. And I feel like when it comes to Kanye and when it comes to working with corporations, I feel like he's either very naive or he's very gullible or maybe both because he sometimes believes that there's always a better corporation around the corner who's going to be able to, you know, do everything that he pleases and they're also not going to annoy him 
and they're also going to let him do whatever he wants to do, right? I don't think that, that they exist. I think corporations, regardless of how successful you are, are always going to want to stick their nose in and get involved and change things around because effectively, the people who are working in those corporations, the people who are working high up in those positions, the executives or whatnot, or the board members and stuff, they also have a job to do. And they also have people to promote, people to impress, sorry, to get promotions. So why wouldn't they want to have their name associated with one of the biggest projects, one of the biggest money earners associated with Adidas, one of the biggest cultural moments associated with Adidas um, out there? Why wouldn't they want to get themselves involved in it? So I think kind of complaining about Easy Day and complaining that Adidas maybe never spoke to him and it's something that they created without his, of, without his written permission, blah, blah, blah. I think it's a bit rich. But regardless, let's read the comment anyway. The reply back on DM to this guy called chase um chase was it was it called chase sees ghost it says as follows this is kind of replying to the guy via instagram dms because i guess Kanye is using instagram a lot more these days i see him liking random posts on random accounts he's leaving comments on people's pages and shit and clearly he's following people too and clearly he's replying to people's dms this is the follows a that's made up the easy day idea without my approval then went then went and brought back older styles without my approval picked colors and named them without my approval and went and hired people that worked for me without my approval stole my colorways without my approval stole my styles and materials approach without my approval went and hired a gm of yeezy without my approval took talent on the production side and sprinkled them throughout adidas originals without my approval even though they did a blanchard collaboration they they completely sold slowed down the production of the shoes um, on the shoes me and Demna developed for Gap by trying to bully Gap even though my contract states I can do casual shoes which was which I was doing when I did fashion shows now that's such an interesting bit because I think there's been a lot of confusion around is Yeezy under Adidas Originals or is Yeezy its own entity now I guess what we know now for sure is that Adidas produces Easy Yeezy shoes and he definitely has a exclusive contract signed with Yeezy that doesn't allow him to basically make shoes with other companies. So he's got a non, what's he got? He's got a non-competitive clause or something in there. So he can't do any Nike with Nike, any work with sorry Nike, New Balance, anything that you would consider direct competition to what um, Yeezy do. But then I guess he then fine tuned the contract to say that he can do footwear for other brands who don't primarily do you would guess trainers or something, whatever it may be called, or maybe the model doesn't need to be deemed as a trainer. I don't know, whatever it may be. But that's an interesting part of the story there that he's getting irate about. It says, um, even though my contract states I can do casual shoes, which I was doing and did fashion shows, um, when originally I ordered Adidas to make more Yeezy slides, the GMs to my, said to my face, sorry, lied to my face and said they didn't have the capacity. Meanwhile, Adidas was copying my slides and making their own version of the Yeezy slide. Yeezy is 68% of the Adidas online sales. God step in. The Yeezy slide question, comment from Kanye is really interesting. Because, no, sorry, not Yeezy slide. Um, uh, yeah, Yeezy slide comment is interesting. Is it interesting what I'm saying? Because from what I've basically seen, having been a bit of a Nike fiend my entire life, Nike were notorious for this, right? They'd bring in a influencer, a brand, a celebrity, or they just make a, a really hype model to kind of commemorate a public holiday. And usually what happened is that you can count your bottom dollar on it like two months later, or maybe sometimes even a month later, there'll be a similar colorway that'll come out of that limited edition shoe as a gr so they're basically double dip in that respect and i was always under the i always kind of thought to myself if you're a creative and you got a chance to make some shoes with nike and then two months later a month later you saw them in flipping foot locker would that kind of annoy you because you think like maybe i was, that was meant to be exclusive meant to sell out meant to be something that kind of people kind of remember it was a good moment and now who you are selling the same type of shoe with super you know, with far less quality materials or maybe some stuff removed from it and you're calling it the same thing. It's like, no, it's not the same thing at all. Zero. I think that's really weird. The other line I think is really interesting too that I'm not really sure if, if that's legit or not because it sounds like a crazy number. But he says at the bottom here, Yeezy is 68% of Adidas's online sales. 68%, which is absolutely nuts. I'm not sure if this includes Adidas Originals, the website, much of it includes Adidas performance website, much of it includes all Adidas are sold all online in terms of all different stores, all the big stores out there like Dover Street and Essence and stuff. I'm not too sure. But regardless, even if it's just him compete with Adidas's main site, 
to account for over half of their sales online on just Yeezy product is wild to me. Maybe it makes more sense because a lot of their items, when it comes to Yeezys, average, you know, per ticket item is maybe 100 plus, maybe 150 plus, right? So maybe it makes sense that they're able to make that much money. But God damn it, man. How are they able to make that much money? It's absolutely crazy. How much money are able to make off the back of that? Um, and yeah, the copying thing is just is what it is, honestly. I don't sure people kind of get their knickers and twist about it. But overall, my pain about this, concerning Kanye and corporations, is that corporations are always going to corporate. They're always going to do what they're going to do. And to sit there and expect corporations to kind of bend at your wall because you make them a lot of money is silly because many people have come in and made them money and they've still kind of fucked them over. And I also think it's interesting too because this may be some sort of proof from that infamous Kanye interview with Sway, where he's like, how Sway, how Sway? Maybe Sway had a point. At some point, you're going to need to invest in yourself and just do this by yourself. But Kanye loves talking about dismantling the industry or kind of bursting through, but he effectively wants to work with them really, really bad. It kind of explains that video of kind of Kanye West holding Rick Owens' plate as he's eating and shit. Secretly, he's always wanted to be part of the fashion glitterati. He probably hides it a bit more because he stays in California all the time, but he always wanted to be in Paris. He always wanted to be on the front row. He always wanted to be hobnobbing with all the big executives and, the, and magazine executives and stuff. That's what he's always wanted to do, but unfortunately, things never really transpired that way. But I don't know, man. I just think it's a bit weird that he's comparing Because again, I think I mentioned on Twitter that it kind of sounds to me a little bit similar to like Wale. When Wale was complaining about record labels and about getting swindled and about they don't really help you and no, 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 no. he then he then like a couple weeks later goes and signs for another label and says nah but this one's different. It's like come on man, you can't just be going from one hand sh golden handshake to another just because they're giving you a nice little advance beforehand. That's just like that's just stupid to me personally. I'd never like that kind of stuff. But again, Kanye complaining about Adidas. Let's see where this takes us. Does this mean we'll get more Adidas stuff from Kanye? It doesn't mean you'll throw his toys at the prime and just go with somebody else. Let's wait and see. Oh yeah, this is a really good article. This is courtesy of New York Times and it talks about the creation of the Yeezy engineered by Balenci Yeezy Gap engineered by Balenciaga collaboration and it's titled Chaos and Creation Inside Making of the Yeezy Gap. In 2022, in 2020, sorry, two fashion brands announced an unusual alliance. Now that goods are finally hitting stores, a Yeezy Gap and a corporation a corporate a creative cautionary tale or a new model for fashion to come absolutely incredible so obviously most of you guys on this podcast would know that i'm absolutely obsessed with demna he is a creator of vetema and now obviously the creative director or the menswear or the fashion director of balenciaga but effectively what he done at vetema for me was my awakening moment to fashion i've always been into fashion but i kind of got off of put, put off from it a few months a few years probably prior yeah, maybe a couple of years before Demna actually launched Vetema. And I kind of stopped paying attention to shows more often. I just kind of checked in from here and there. But as soon as Demna came around with Vetema, that aesthetic that he does in terms of that kind of trashy Eastern European, um, Central European, or just Euro trashy type of vibe in general that he does really resonated with me because at the time as well, I was spending a lot of time going to different locations in Europe, especially these tough places like Berlin. And I saw a lot of the same character chores that she was displaying you know, in that bar she was playing at, as well as the same people that I saw kind of at parties wherever I went out. So it was nice to see that kind of reflected when, on the fashion runway when it comes to Demna. And then, of course, he then goes and smashes at Balenciaga as a supreme job to the point where he effectively gave up his um, brand, Balenciaga, sorry, v Vetema, to his brother, Gurum, who beforehand did all the business and now is kind of leading the charge in terms of pairing that collection together. But one of the things that's always kind of interested me going forward has always been um dance music clothing dance music centered clothing like is that something you would ever ever yes yeah, so the easy gap thing uh clothing yeah that's what i'm talking about so the thing that really intrigued me about this article that I really liked, obviously explained the, in detail how the Yeezy Gap NGA Balenciaga collaboration came together, but it also cleared up a lot of things that were kind of on my mind. One of the things being the lady called Mawa Loma, Mawa Loa, sorry, who was enlisted to kind of come on board and kind of lead the charge in terms of putting the collection together when the first sort of snippets and leaks came out of the collection where we saw that bag, we saw some blue type of coat that wasn't the coat that came out recently but it was another coat and then um we didn't really hear much from that afterwards and i guess she stopped working with kanye um the lady uh mara loa mara loa sorry and then mara lola sorry and then um of course she then started 
doing her brand again going forward. Now, it was a bit strange because we never really got an explanation for it. But I guess it's kind of cleared it up. This is an article courtesy of New York Times. It says as follows. Ye, whose vision, according to Gap, was to create modern, elevated basics for men, women and kids at accessible price points, got to work, bringing in Nigerian-British designer Mawa Lola Olug Olugunlusi as a design director and testing out pieces earlier September, summer 2022. Um, Miss Oluglusi left after a year at the expiration of her contract. So it was always a one-year contract, which is another surprising thing to me because I think there was a lot of speculation online that they had a falling out, that something happened behind the scenes, which it probably could have still happened. It could be lined as one year, one year contract kind of expired, but that kind of helps to clear up that rumor going forward. And then I really like some of the comments from Demna regarding his creative process with Kanye and how that put, got put together. Um, where is it? Connection here with Kadimna. Where is it? Da, da, da. Lawson. Ba, 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 ba. Uh, yeah, this is the one. So, um, though he was busy with several Blanchard collections, Demna said he felt he the need to be there for him and help him create the solid foundation for the easiest, the year aesthetic, in, on which they can now build to accelerate the process. Hence the name of the collaboration. Engineered by Balenciaga. They were, the, Demna said, engineering the prototypes in Balenciaga studio in Paris and Zurich after he and Ye talked or text through the ideas, which is absolutely incredible. Really, really cool going forward. Um, interesting. Interesting enough, I think they mentioned in the article that this is a one time only collaboration and that they're going to switch around the designers. But then Kanye went on the comments and replied to that story that was published on Instagram. And basically said, nah, we're going to have loads more coming forward going with um, the Balenciaga and Gap collection which I think is good going forward because I'd like to see them iterate that idea a little bit more. And I also think, unfortunately for Gap also, unless they've got Kanye involved in this collaboration, they're not going to be able to get Demna to do it either because unless they pay him an absorbent amount of money. So it's great that they're able to kind of tap into that kind of um, resource with Kanye and Demna's relationship. And it continues here. It says, lots of talking and thousands of images shared, he said, on their exchanges. They talked about how Ye wanted fabric that is very light, but also warm and makes sound. Kind of like nylon, but not like nylon. Things that seem to be impossible or very hard to make technically. The interesting thing about this is that this also reflects um, and also is quite similar to how people talk about Virgil, R.I.P. the Dead, and about his way of collaborating, right? And how he would like to kind of send pictures on Instagram, send pictures via WhatsApp, um, annotate stuff via iMessage and all that sort of good stuff. And that's how he basically was able to build collections while being on the on the go and not kind of relying on all the time having sit-down meetings or going on Zoom. He could always kind of do stuff on the fly on his phone. And I guess that kind of work ethic and that kind of way of working is something that Kanye does as well. Maybe he learned it from Kanye, I'm not sure, going forward but it does make a lot of sense for these guys who are kind of always on the move always have a million projects going on that at one point you have to utilize your smartphone and these days smartphones you know what was that graphic that came out a while back that showed like a, how much more powerful a regular iphone is compared to like a regular macbook pc back in the day do you know what i mean it continues here it says Ye's not really interested in fashion at all, which is interesting development, interesting insight here from Demna. He's not interested in fashion at all. He wants to know how can you make a new version of a hoodie? What's next? And what do we want to wear in 20 years? Which makes a lot of sense because for the entire time he's promoting Gap, you heard him talk a lot about wanting to make the perfect um, hoodie, right? The perfect $100 hoodie that you could wear, you know, in any occasion that was essentially bulletproof, um, blah, 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 blah. And you never heard, went, heard him once mention anything to do with fashion. It was always stuff to do about, you would assume, practicality, um, resourcefulness, and all that sort of good stuff. It was never, ever, ever to do with, oh, I have the ability to make this stuff and I'm just going to make it for fashion's sake. No, it's always to be practical. And I love it because it also echoes one of the main things I remember loving when I heard uh, Rick Owens' interview for the first time where he essentially said that he always makes his jackets with... Um, book readers in mind or people that like to eat on, on the move and when they grab a sandwich so he's made them always big enough where you can stick a book in and big enough where you can stick a you know a sandwich like you know maybe an apple a sandwich whatever else you want to stick in there and I like the way that Kanye kind of approaches fashion the same or clothes making the same way where it's about the shape of materials more so about anything else and it continues here it says then Demna said once, the shape was there, I would make a decision, okay, it's ready, we launch it. At that point, we would he would send images, um, the designs to Ye and Gap teams in Los Angeles, after which they would start the process of trying to industrialize them. Ye also went to Paris, and Miss Lawson said prototypes were also created by Yeezy Gap team in Los Angeles and categorized the teamwork as a partnership. 
there are the me being on board giving him resources demo said so this could be an amount of letting go and to the close which are, so yeah so it's absolutely incredible i love everything about it um i really like how they put together the absolute the store itself and the activation inside the store has been really cool to see from people who have been sharing a lot of the images on there they've got all the clothes lined up on these really um basic minimal looking black rails and then they've also got them in these massive industrial bags that you'd find in like work sites and stuff that are usually full of cement or other things that they're transporting and they've got all the clothes piled up in there as well going forward which is pretty cool to see so you get to really touch and feel smell and experience the clothes once you're digging in trying to find them i also like the activation they did outside where they kind of have all the clothes in like trash bins and stuff that was really cool People will see with the with the Anna record is showing you people with the Dove logo back hoodie thing going on there. You got the snapback hat that was definitely inspired by a collection from Demna, which I really like the look of. Something he's been wearing a while here, um, out and about and stuff. And yeah, loads of really good stuff here available. And I can't wait to see most of more of it get available online and in stores. I might end up buying maybe an Anna record or a hoodie going forward. You got the shades that Kanye wore at um, what's it called? What's that festival called? Rolling Loud. They look really good on Northwest. There, really, really nice. And then you've also got Kanye's comment here, where he basically um, clarifies that Yeezy Gap, engineered by Balenciaga, is actually just the beginning. God bless you. So it's not going to stop now. It's going to continue going on, despite what them basically said. That it's only a one-year contract. Um, so that's pretty cool to see. Um, I wonder who's going to be featured on it. He's got some guy wearing the Yeezy Gap hoodie himself. I heard the sizing is a bit crazy, so be careful about what size you're basically ordering these. Um, but yeah, man, all good, all good, all bloody good. Let's talk about this as well. This is really Let's talk about this too. This is really depressing, but also very um, affirming to me because it basically confirms everything that I've been seeing when I've been going outside. And this is news courtesy of The Guardian. And it says it's titled... One in five nightclubs in Great Britain closed during COVID pandemic. Data shows only 1,130 nightclubs remain in England, Wales and Scotland. A 20% drop on March 2020. 20% drop. Absolutely incredible, man. Absolutely incredible. I've always said from the beginning that I think pandemics effectively killed clubs. But then I feel like the, the lockdown essentially killed people's desire to go clubbing that's a different yeah so pandemic closed lockdown uh close um the, the pandemic cl um closed the clubs and then the lockdown closed people's desires because i feel like or got rid of the desire to go to the club because i feel like especially got rid of your desire you end up to be, you end up figuring out ways to be more resourceful you end up ways to have more fun doing the things doing newer things than your usual going to a nightclub and in general you grew up a lot during that time too so maybe you just got out of it but for a business most nightclubs were the first places to close and the last to reopen for natural reasons and for reasons that made sense at the time because of how the virus spread and it being respiratory and the fact that it was there was loads of aircon everywhere blah 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 loads of kisses it could be that it's another bout of covid right coming through again that's basically caused most of these clubs to close but i think in general as a business it's just impossible impossible i think most clubs have showed it to run a business in any kind of lockdown pandemic it's just impossible because effectively the whole point of a nightclub is to get many people as you can into one space before it's too full and then after that let people run let people run the whole night let people do their thing get sweaty you know what i mean that's basically what you should be doing in nightclubs going forward but anyway let's do the article it says one in five nightclubs in great britain have closed over the past three years after the sector was badly hit during covid19 pandemic and other economic pressures figures shared by the nighttime industries association the ntia and trade body representing businesses in nighttime economy revealed that there are only 1130 nightclubs left in england wales and scotland there are a 20 percent drop since the first lockdown of march 2020 which is absolutely depressing let me see how many nightclubs exist in flipping um how many nightclubs in let's say berlin don't piss me off there's 4,500 bars and clubs in Berlin. Again, they're not club, nightclub, nightclubs because it's hard to dif differentiate between them. I'm not sure what constitutes a bar and a nightclub. If you have a dance floor, does that mean that you're essentially a nightclub? Or do you have to, or can bars have night or dance floors too? I'm not too sure. But regardless, there are 4,500 
clubs and bars in Berlin alone. And we have only 1,130 nightclubs in the whole of England, the whole of, sorry, the whole of the United Kingdom. Absolutely incredible. And that basically proves everything that's wrong with the situation we're in at the moment. And they can't sit here and blame the pandemic and lockdown only because this is a problem that's been happening from day dot. It's not only pandemic and um, lockdown specific. I think this has to do a lot with the government. This has to do a lot of people's attitudes here in the UK. We're very anti-fun. There's a lot of rules and regulations behind everything that we do in terms of setting up boxing matches, in terms of setting up YouTube events, in terms of getting permission to film videos in certain places. Um, you know, in terms of riding an electric scooter on the street, there's so many rules and, spe and stipulations that exist when it concerns um, when it concerns everything to do with flipping nightlife and parties and fun stuff, that it does really get it does really get a little bit demoralizing to try and organize those things because you're not too sure if it's going to be successful. Mostly, well, you have some reasons are based outside your control. Not most, but some of them are based outside your control, which can be really frustrating. But it continues. It says. There were 1,446 nightclubs in Britain in December 2019, 1,924 in December 2014, according to Europe, affected by the data and record accusation confirmation firm. The culmination of pandemic debt and growing bill costs and workfare challenges, supply chains um, are contributed, so have, have contributed to the slow ticket sales and the frequent frequency of these venues. And I've noticed it myself. I've said many a times here on this podcast and to friends, I've been to the Bergheim many times, right? I've been to Bergheim Panorama Bar many, many times in Berlin, the premier sort of nightclub within the dance music space. And I've been there pre-2019 and I went there again, you know, in post-pandemic world for the Club Sylvester thing that they do, right? Which is essentially their way of celebrating New Year's Eve, um, you know, making up for the last one that they kind of missed last minute because of the lockdown or whatnot in Germany. But, even I have noticed a stark difference in the terms in terms of the amount of people in that nightclub. Don't get me wrong, the queues can still be a little bit hectic if they decide they want to let you queue, or maybe if it's quote unquote too full for the night. But for the most part, um, Berlin and you know, for, but for the most part, the Berghain isn't as full as it once was. And I've noticed in my own eyes, it isn't as once full as it once was at all. Zero. It's not even close to being as full as it once was. Um, and it's sad to see, to be completely honest, because if the Berghain is struggling to get people in there and they're you know cranking out the events and trying to get back to normal as soon as possible you can just imagine what it's like for like a far out of the place basement bar somewhere that was doing fairly well before the lockdown was looking to expand and do different things and then suddenly it gets hit with that it's absolutely gruesome it really really is gruesome and then on top of that add to that all the um, reports that I kind of read on another podcast concerning Gen Z and millennials and why they have the changing attitudes to do going out. And then on top of that, look at the economy in general with inflation, you know, the rising price of oil and everything else being affected, effect effectively affecting everything else out there in society. I even saw the other day that cheeseburgers and McDonald's have gone up in price because of what's been going on in the economy. So all these things have definitely played a part in people's decision making about going out clubbing. Because if you don't have that many, if you don't have a lot of money, doing those kind of things in general is just a bit nuts. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's just a bit nuts. Like, going clubbing and stuff, especially in a post-pandemic world where you're not really forced to go anywhere because a lot of people are essentially still a bit shy or have some sort of lingering COVID PS PTSD in terms of meeting people and going around people and stuff. So people kind of avoid it or they go to outdoor spaces. So those things are still available, right? And people are doing them en masse, but clubs have not really returned back to normal. They really haven't. And I doubt they will, to be honest. I really doubt they will. Especially when you've got people like Amy La Amy fucking Lammy in charge of the nighttime economy, not doing absolutely nothing, hasn't been seen in person in Yonks. That disgrace, to be honest. Continues anyway. It says, um, the combination of the, it says, yeah, the venue, tra the, the trade body, sorry, um, also warned that the unique, the true impact, sorry, of the cost of inflation of businesses has yet to be seen, with more than 53.8% of respondents still, new, re still to renew their energy contracts. Some parts of Britain, they said here, were worse hit than others, such as the Midlands, where nearly 30% of nightclubs have closed since March 20. And you can only imagine that would be the case. 
because of their smaller towns that have less of a catchment area or maybe they were relying a lot on university students to fill up their space and now they've left or now they're working from home sorry it's absolutely crazy how it's impacted everybody going forward and then of course you've got the added inclusion of a lot of foreigners not being able to go to these nightclubs because of the change you know in the laws especially with brexit or a lot of them decided to go back home during the pandemic because they want to go and look after family members because if anything the pandemic also highlighted and proved to us just how family orientated a lot of those people are from other communities they do like to go back home a lot and visit their family they do have a lot of family that live in you know one household com com you know accommodation and shit so they want to go and look after them that way a lot of them maybe don't earn that much money so instead of working here and busting their ass they'd rather go back home and kind of do that and a lot of people that i've basically seen who basically did a lot of that seasonal kind of work working in bars and clubs in europe and stuff or in london and then going back and taking the money a lot of those people haven't come back to their jobs i know a lot of nightclub owners and um and people and stuff were basically complaining when the lockdown did end i think the first couple of times that effectively the lockdown killed their business because it effectively got rid of or allowed them to lose a lot of their key employees that are basically holding everything down in their business and i guess in bar work or in every work, i guess in every avenue of life when you find really good people you don't let them go it doesn't matter if they are dustbin men doesn't matter if they flip burgers if they serve your drinks or they work in a big glitzy corporation if you've got good people you don't let them go and i guess the pandemic forced people to let them go and then essentially they've never been able to recover off the back of that which has been quite sad i think for everybody associated with those kind of things i think going forward but hey ho i guess what can we do what can we do um but yeah um, i'm gonna pause the podcast for now what can we do what can we do and it continues anyway it says as follows It says as follows here. Um, the trade body also warned. Da, 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 sorry, sorry. It continues here. It said da, da, da. when broken down, the region that experienced the biggest percentage drop, twenty eight percent nightclubs in December, was Central England and Central Wales, um, followed by the southeast of out of outside London, twenty seven, and the southwest, twenty seven, and there was a twenty five percent drop in nightclubs in Yorkshire and a twenty four percent fall in the northwest, while Scotland had a twenty one percent drop. And again, these places can't survive twenty one percent drops. The scenes, what I mean, like twenty one percent drop effectively means you might have to. Change change career do you know what i mean because some of the bigger clubs that are basically holding you down with residencies and stuff or allowing you to put on consecutive nights you know month on month those places go and then suddenly you can't put on those parties anymore suddenly the people that you are promoting to aren't there anymore it does really create a vacuum and essentially you have to go and seek other means of employment or other means of generating income it's absolutely brutal man what this is effectively done to people it continues the nti chief executive michael kill said late night economy businesses were one of the quickest sectors to rebound during the financial crisis many years ago harboring um an abundance of, re of resilience and entrepreneurial spirit it without a doubt that these businesses particularly nightclubs have had a huge part to play in the return in the regeneration of the high street in towns and cities across the uk beyond the generation of the foot flow through the trade domestic and international visitors to clubs support the local economy in secondary and tertiary um, per um, purchases through accommodation travel and retail that's something that's always been annoying to me when it comes to gentrification because effectively i feel like gentrification kills the ability for local communities or local areas to basically have all that extra money coming off the back of nightclubs because when night when nightlife is booming in your area you look at places like hackney wick you look at places like manor house you look at places like tottenham places like peckham brixton when clubs start to spring up out of the blue out of those kind of areas right they essentially draw people in and then people start you know setting up nightclubs there setting up sorry um uh, club nights there setting up their own events or just basically being there often it might make them want to then go and rent an apartment or buy a house there which then might make them more likely than not go and invest in the local economy by going through their weekly shop or going to local businesses like hairdressers and shit to go and get their hair done now all those things get happen a lot due to people moving there for nightclubs and nightlife type of stuff but i have real doubts about whether or not that kind of chain of um, investing back in the economy continues when you then go and set up these big glitzy shiny glass and metal uh, buildings in these local areas and they basically gentrify them i don't think that actually happens when you gentrify places i feel like gentrification effectively kills it because those accommodation units or those apartments they don't really they price certain people out so the people that are basically making those places hot the hipsters and the creative people they can't afford two three four five grand a month so they're not going to be able to 
be in those kind of spaces so you're effectively going to um rent those places out to foreign investors or people with a lot of money who effectively don't really give a shit about the local economy because they basically just go there to rest their head and whatnot it's pretty diabolical and i think that's a real crying shame going forward it really really is it continues here it says kill said that businesses played a key part in people's decision making process from choosing university or colleges and influencing investment choices for businesses relocating or expanding to the accommodate um, for a young workforce not forgetting the important part they play in people's physical mental and social well-being the government needs to recognize the economic cultural and community value of clubs and the wider nighttime economy which is never going to happen either if it's for a labor government or for a tory government this country for some reason at its core has a real issue when it comes to nightlife and clubs let alone outdoor festivals and whatever it may be there's a real problem with people gathering if it ha if it doesn't have to do with people gathering in restaurants or inside of theaters and stuff that's okay you can open as many theaters and restaurants as you want restaurants don't stop opening up right they keep springing up all over the place but when it comes to nightclubs it's really hard to open a nightclub and be successful for a long period of time and it's also very very difficult to set up open air festivals in london that sound good that produce to a high level that accommodate a lot of people without people throwing their toys out of the prime look what they're doing with notting hill carnival every year notting hill carnival is at fucking risk and that is a that is a British institution and they don't want to let that and they kind of want to kind of let that one go, sweep it under the rug, despite what economic help it might bring to that local community as well when it's on every single year. They don't want to do that going forward. So it's absolute travesty. And I don't know why it is. If someone else knows about it and can kind of clue me in, please do provide some context in the comments because I'm really confused why this country seems to hate fun. And it continues here. It says Lisa Landy, um, Lisa Nandy, sorry, Labour's shadow um, leveling up secretary said that reopening once loved nightclubs in the struggling towns and city centers could help to revive high street yeah okay every single town um has lost a nightclub they feel very strongly about that was part of our history and our heritage says labor you know which they want to try and get back involved in but and i don't know if it's going to be really applicable i don't think i think all these flipping government all these government officials all these parties basically hate fun but if they don't if they don't hate fun i'd like to be proven wrong i would like to be proven wrong oh yeah another thing i want to talk about too I'm actually going to Berlin, so I'm happy about that. Should be going there next week, so I'm really looking forward to that. Should be absolutely of a barnstormer of occasion. And yes, I do know I trashed the place. I made some very disparaging comments about the time I was there and criticised all the hipsters and criticised the club culture and essentially was, um, you know, saying without saying that I was kind of over it. But unfortunately, I have some holiday left over and I didn't know where else to go in Europe. I didn't want to go anywhere too... East, Eastern Europe or Central Europe um, obviously Kiev is completely off the list now considering what's going on over there with the war in Russia and obviously my thoughts and prayers go out to anybody over there that's affected with it I didn't want to go anywhere inland here in England because I can do that over the weekend and I had like a weekend free so no, I could do that over the weekend in terms of not taking holiday and I wanted to actually take a proper like Friday off Monday off because the last time I went I actually went and did a bit of um working from home i didn't actually go there just on holiday i went there obviously partly to do my work and obviously to work to go and have a night out and effectively the reason why i did it that way is because i wanted to prove to myself and i wanted to see if i was grown up enough mature enough to go and do that because i think in the past maybe prior to the pandemic i would have been the type of person who would have probably sacked off work and got in trouble and then just went out but this time around i was way more responsible i just effectively treated it like I, it was any other weekend when i was working at home and i effectively just worked in the morning finished my my work in the evening and then bam i headed out got something to eat and then went to the club so that's effectively how i went and did about my thing so maybe that kind of affected my overall way i perceived the nights out because i was effectively leaving clubs in berlin at 4 a.m 5 a.m which is effectively it's like leaving a nightclub at flipping 10 p.m in berlin because they go on for so long so when you leave at four it's effectively getting that to its best that's when all the actual good people come in that's when the good music starts and stuff so maybe i've messed up that way but regards i'm still looking forward to it anyway one well, of the first thing i'm looking forward to is i'm going to look definitely this time around hit up loads more different clubs i spent way too much time in Berghain. i love that place but it's good to kind of mix things up when you go to a city like um, berlin as i mentioned in the previous topic talking about how many nightclubs in london have closed down i read an article that said we have 1130 nightclubs in the entirety of the uk which is wales and scotland combined but in berlin alone one city they have over 4000 close to 5000 bars and nightclubs in that city 
And one of the main places I want to go and visit, which I haven't visited for a while because it's been closed, is Trezor, a legendary nightclub, legendary techno nightclub in Berlin. A nightclub that I'm pretty sure is still in the same location because even though this video I'm going to play from 1996, um, shows a very completely a, a very different Berlin to the one we're used to it still kind of reminds me a lot of the same sort of way that I kind of would go when I was going to Trezor in terms of crossing the street or crossing the road which is quite interesting but the one thing that kind of points out is very interesting about it is back in 1996 the people that were obsessed with techno or obsessed with dance music were very different to the, how they look like nowadays in terms of aesthetic like there's a lot more color there's a lot more smiles there's a lot more talking, a lot more like, I don't know, there's a lot more, whatever that vibe is around it. Whereas these times I feel like a lot more people are kind of, I wouldn't say insular, but they kind of just focus on their own little rave. They're all wearing black. They're all wearing kind of ghetto, goth ninja sort of attire. They're all wearing really chunky boots. They've all got silver or reflective sunglasses. They've all got wacky piercings and electric type style um, tattoo art on their flipping bodies and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's all very uniform, which is something that kind of really pissed me off when I was there last time. And then, so the reason why it pissed me off because I felt like, how could I get looked at like a... So you know when you go to hipster space, they always look down on you because they don't know who you are. Not because they don't think you're cool, because they don't know who you are. Or sometimes they want to kind of try and big time you in hipster space. That's why most people don't like going to hipster spaces, right? But I find it difficult to get... I find it difficult to accept a hipster looking down on me or thinking they're better than me when they all look like each other, when they all look the same. The same thing happened back in the day in Brick Lane. When you saw people in Brick Lane wearing brown boots or wearing those Zara boots with those fucking hats and stuff and those fucking um, Taliban scarves back in the day, it's hard to take those guys seriously and let them kind of big time you and act like they're cooler than you when they're all wearing exactly the same attire. We can't be running with that. But regardless, I love the vibe of this video. This video is titled Trezor Club Berlin, Leipzig... Uh, Leip Leipziger Straza July J July 1996 and obviously it's footage from that time I'm going to play a clip of it now so you can see what people look like and you can also hear the sound of the music they were playing back then and I'm really 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 looking forward to going to Trezor when I eventually go to Berlin next week great cars coming out of on the road to the club it's funny though because nowadays people don't do this it's very frowned upon in berlin to jaywalk kind of thing people always cross at the crossing which is weird but the roads are really wide in berlin they kind of remind me a lot of um old enough a lot of like new york and we go to america as a brit we're used to jaywalking and running across the street when the cars are not there, not waiting until the flipping light goes red and stuff all the time. But you go to a place like America and suddenly like, oh shit, I can't jaywalk because it's, a, it's legitimately like 50 meters across or maybe like 100 meters across. I mean, by the time I run over there, a car's going to knock me upside my head and my shoes are going to be flying up in the air Reddit style. Look how dilapidated everything looks. Everything looks so dilapidated. If you're not seeing this via the podcast, essentially they're walking into this incredible industrial area. Everything looks like it's either been bombed or it's being knocked down so it can be regenerated. I can only imagine. I can only imagine how cheap the rents were back then around this sort of time. You could have a house there probably for like, what would you say, 100 euros a month or something crazy, high ceilings, loads of rooms. Um, it's not really, you know, this, the buildings aren't full of people so you can make as much noise as you want. Loads of warehouse parties, loads of communication collaboration everything going on there just look at the site there just look at the people i'm seeing on screen now i'm seeing loads of blues loads of greens loads of whites loads of khakis loads of colors except for all black which is completely different to what we see nowadays again loads of scenes of people walking around And this is maybe another good part as well to mention. This kind of culture they have there, and I think they have in most European cities, in and around the clubs. We don't have that a lot here because people complain about noise pollution. A lot of it has to do with neighbours, not even to with sight. Inside the clubs is already annoying in terms of London and the UK because they search you really aggressively. Security guards are always walking and patrolling the dance floors with flashlights and stuff. It's annoying. But the most annoying part, I think, of nightclub culture in the UK has to be what happens in and what happens in and around it. 
because I feel like a lot of the joy, a lot of the kind of excitement of going to a nightclub is when you kind of leave your house, when you're on the way there, grabbing a little pre-drink, or in this case in Berlin, grab, grabbing a club mate, maybe with a vodka mix in it, grabbing something to eat quickly, talking to somebody that's going on the way there that you're going to, and just the whole ambiance around it. And when you get to the club itself, maybe you don't want to be on a dance floor right away. You're waiting for the DJ that you want to go see to play. So you wait outside, have a smoke, share a drink, get high, whatever it may be, or just kind of, you know, enjoy your high when you're out there tripping your balls, whatever it may be. That's kind of the whole ambience of it, what happens inside and outside. But in the UK, we can't even have the outside thing because of noise pollution. So they're always pushing you back inside, saying, don't keep the noise down, blah, blah, blah. And it kind of just kind of... It kind of just um, gets you out of your zone. Do you know what I mean? It's a real vibe killer. And I feel like this is part of the reason why those clubs are so amazing. Because, of course, they've got great spaces and they can do what they want in there. But a lot of the stuff around it is just relax and chill. You know what I mean? Just it's growing up. They treat like adults. One guy wearing all black. Wearing a black t-shirt, sorry. Dying his hair, dancing. Absolutely amazing. Okay, I see. I do see big hanging earrings. I do see the same type of glasses we wear nowadays, which maybe this is maybe interesting because the style is quite similar, but the colors aren't. So the color palette is definitely way darker nowadays, but the styles are very similar in terms of the big baggy t-shirts, in terms of the tight t-shirts, in terms of the combat pants, in terms of the kind of matrix style glasses, in terms of the really buzz cut short hair, in terms of the big hooped earrings, those are very, very similar that I see nowadays. Even, even some, of the, some of the graphics on a the t-shirt, they're very reminiscent of what you see nowadays, but just not the colors. So cool. But anyway, that's basically most of it I'm going to show. I'm not going to show the whole thing, but you can effectively see everybody there um, chilling, having a whale of a time, enjoying themselves. And um, I'm really looking forward to going to Trezor. And I'm really looking forward to going to this event that I'm going to, which is Trezor 31, which is obviously their 31 anniversary at this venue called Craftwork Berlin, which I've never been to before, which looks absolutely incredible. It's like a multi use type of space in there they've got an exhibition running there at the moment talking about the history of trezor with loads of interesting things going on in there that's set really well and um, it kind of reminds me a lot of Berghain in terms of its architecture and what it kind of looks like in the on the inside but i'm really looking forward to going to see it and and kind of hanging out in there and seeing everything that kind of surrounds it um so that's going to be really really interesting to see when i do end up going there um in berlin when i'm there next week so i'm really 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 bloody looking forward to it and i can't wait to see this thing myself when i'm there i really really can't man it's gonna be an absolute barnstorm an event it honestly is all these different people playing um Ohm, globus you've got the heron sauna event happening which i missed in london they played here at fold but the tickets were sold out really quickly which goes to show man there's a lot of appeal a lot of desire for that kind of um trashy euro trash centric club nights they have going on in um, berlin for it to come over here people really love that kind of stuff so it sold really fucking well man it sold out completely there weren't any tickets available on resale nothing available on ticket swap nothing available on facebook unless you want to get scammed again facebook as well keep your eye out if you're a person that goes to clubs whenever you tickets sell out or you only go to gigs people always random people always say yeah i've got free tickets and they'll offer you tickets on facebook and usually they're always scammers random people that you, you would look at and don't think that they'll be into the kind of thing that you're kind of going to it's usually an easy sus or tell, tell them to send you proof and use a really pixelated image of a pdf it doesn't have any details of the event you're going to or it's done really poorly it's a really poor photoshop um but yeah a lot of people running scams on facebook when it comes to tickets which is really disappointing but um yeah there's a there's this going on and there's also the exhibition I'm not sure if it's if it's is it over already. Um, Trezor exhibition is that already done? That's what I want to go to actually. You can actually book it somewhere here. Oh, there it is. Yeah, the Trezor exhibition is available here to book. Fifth of August, obviously coming up. You can book it. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to going to this. Uh, 
Yeah, so this is a Trezor Berlin um, is a personalized audio led exhibition experienced by in craft work through film, sculpture, archival image objects and photography. The exhibition explores the three decade long history of the surrounding the techno club Big Bang in the early 90s. Exhibition examines Trezor's winding journey in the context from its prehistory and its unusual economic and social conditions of West Berlin to its transition into the cosmopolitan capital city of today through archival materials, oral histories and immersive immersive soundscapes created in partnership with Usomo. Trezor's 31 exhibition explores the personal narratives that underpin techno club culture um, since its beginnings and aesthetics social movement. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to going to it. Um, different times of entry. I'm probably going to end up going there, I think on the Sunday. I think that should be the time I'm going to go there. I'm not really too sure. Let's double check the dates here. Oh, am I not going all? Oh no, there's no dates there I can go on. Oh, that's a shame. No, there is. Okay, there is dates. Okay, I'm, I'm bugging out. But yeah, I'm definitely going to go there. Hopefully on a Sunday, get it all locked in and ready to go. So I'm really looking forward to going to see the exhibition at Trezor. Really, really cannot wait to go and see that. Really looking forward to it. Next on the news. Next on the news concerning clubs. We have very interesting information and very vital information for myself because I have been looking for an excuse excuse to go to this location for a very very long time and this just might be it because i'm not you know contrary to popular demand or popular to contrary um assertion you know concerning myself and what i look like and stuff i'm not the biggest weed smoker in the world that's not really something that i've ever really got down with i think because i spent so many years in the church like mostly i'd say maybe plus 20 years in the church in some aspect growing up in the church going to it when i was you know voluntary when i was in my teenage years and early 20s it kind of made me miss a lot of things especially when it comes to you know extracurricular stuff when it comes to like smoking and taking drugs and stuff i started all that stuff really late but in general even when i was allowed to kind of do my own thing i never really gravitate to smoking thankfully because i have a very addictive personality so i can only imagine if i really did get into smoking how detrimental it would have been to my health especially when it comes to i've always had these respiratory issues in terms of nasal polyps i've always had um some level of asthma growing up as well so if i did end up smoking on top of that and playing sports and skateboarding and doing the drugs that i do and all that stuff it would probably wouldn't have ended well for me so i'm glad i didn't get into smoking so because of that i've never visited I'm to them i'm never really curious to go because effectively i'm not going to go out there and hook up with a hooker because that's not something i'm interested in either and i'm not really interested in smoking i would imagine the main part of going to those kind of places if you're not in love with the city itself would be to see the red light district or to go and indulge yourself in the weed culture over there because it's absolutely on another level maybe it's the closest thing that we have to kind of visiting a place like la if you're an Amer if you're an american but um Another part of me that wanted to go to Amsterdam a lot was the fact that their club scene there, right? They've got great festivals there. They've got great clubs there, especially on the outskirts of Berlin. So especially on the outskirts of Amsterdam and just outside of Amsterdam. And one of the nightclubs that I always wanted to kind of check out at the time it launched and opened was this venue called The School. It's an incredible, incredible, incredible space out there in Amsterdam, right? Hopefully someone's got an actual... Hold on. So hopefully someone's got a video of what it looks like on the inside. But I liked how it actually was set up on the inside. It was kind of an open space with like boxes that people kind of stood on. Oh, look, this is my video about it being closed. But um, has someone got, yeah, someone's got a video of it on the inside. There's a video here from the outside that people are guess eating and stuff because it looks like a, it's got a restaurant cafe as well on the outside. You know, standard affair. Let's see this video of courtesy of an account called Local Traveller. Showing us a video of it. Let's lower the sound a little bit here. Skip through. Okay, let's mute the sound completely. But yeah, do you see basically how it's kind of laid out? right um let's pause this but yeah it's kind of it, it kind of just looks really interesting because it's it's basically made in a former school so you've got these really amazing big open windows ceiling to floor basically um like all the loads of light coming in loads of interesting spaces because effectively they're all classrooms so they're all going to be kind of square or rectangle kind of basic acoustics are going to be brilliant too because it's a school uh, school acoustics are always great i remember school discos being some of the best highlights of my life when i went to school back in the day which kind of makes a lot of sense and yeah it just looks like a really interesting venue regardless right let's see another video of it on the inside if we can see here Blah, 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 blah. Where is it here? The school Amsterdam. No, no more videos of it on the inside. Huh. Anyway, regardless. Um, cool venue. Really wanted to go to it and check it out. But of course, um, as I reported in my video that you saw there prior, they got into a bit of controversy 
where essentially they were accused of discrimination and not exactly welcoming in people that were non-white in that kind of space. And of course, there were some issues there concerning bouncers and females and stuff and just the general stuff you hear going on with nightclubs. But I think because it was an accumulation of things going on at the same time, it kind of really blew up and became a big issue because they were basically marketing it as a place that kind of welcomed people from all different backgrounds, all different you know um sexual preferences and whatnot but essentially what was actually happening there on a day-to-day basis was completely contrary to what they were talking about and throughout all the backlash that they were getting online and i think a lot of the owners as well and the founders of the space people that were in charge didn't really deal with it the best at the time i feel like a lot of it was maybe blown out of proportion but they definitely added fuel to the fire because they were very dismissive of people's concerns they didn't really try to listen to a lot of people's concerns and they kind of treated people with a lot of um, contempt i felt like when they were talking about the issues going on in there which again if you're going through a public cancellation one thing you can't do if you're going to respond is treat people with contempt mostly if you're going to respond to those kind of allegations you should maybe you should probably not respond if you're going to be honest right and just kind of try and do the work and correct the issues going forward and maybe make a statement but if you're going to respond on a case-by-case basis or you're going to do what they did and i think they had like a public town square sort of thing um and they didn't really listen to the concerns they didn't really feel like they were really taking it seriously um it felt very combative that's what you don't want to do you want to very you want to very much so allow the people who are complaining and give them a platform to speak acknowledge what they're saying let them be heard and actually try and sound at least sympathetic to their positions and where they're at and trying to outline what you're trying to do to kind of fix it but it didn't and effectively it got to a point where they couldn't rely on they weren't really sure if that reputation was going to harm them going forward. So they kind of, you know, um, by they kind of panicked and basically pulled the cord and closed. But if I'm not mistaken, they might have pulled the cord just before the pandemic happened. So even at the time, it looked a bit hasty and it also looked like they weren't really trying to fix the issue we're just going to close and shut up shop that wasn't what people were basically complaining about but they did it anyway it kind of maybe was a good thing going forward because effectively the people in charge weren't necessarily clicking with the local community anyway so long story short they're now going to reopen it looks like courtesy of news verse courtesy of ra it says amsterdam club the school is going to reopen in september um it says um, yeah, it's, it's going to be open in September for the first time since March 2020. On September the 9th, the school will begin its final 16-month run before closing again in 2024. And it was always meant to be a temporary space. I don't think it was always meant to be permanent. The location is prime, um, you know, so obviously they're going to redevelop it into different things. But it's still a unique enough club, I think, to go to just to visit for once. And again, Amsterdam only being half an hour away from me on a train or whatever it may be, is something that I'm definitely going to go and try and visit. Um, no, the half now maybe on a plane sorry it's definitely a place i want to try to visit now because it gives me an excuse to go because i don't need to worry about having to go there to just you know smoke and go and see hookers i can actually go and enjoy the clubbing scene and i'm no i'm being facetious i know amsterdam has more to it than just clubbing and uh, sorry and it has more to it than just red light district and smoking but someone like myself who kind of tends to go to a lot of these places in europe off the back of techno tourism it's quite nice to know that there are some clubs that i can go to and attend and have a good time in um as well off the back of it but it continues in the article on september 9th the school will begin its final 16 month run before closing again in 2024 in addition to renovations and changes in the layout the club has overall this vision um, um, its team and internal structure implementing new policies such as the code of conduct house rules and an awareness team the club new director of operations Erdal Kieran who joined in July 2021 spearheaded the changes I like what I'm hearing there I like that they kind of addressed the issues they took took it seriously because if you know there are many other clubs that would have seen what happened to them or there's many other clubs that would have been in their position they would have got all that criticism they would have closed down reopened and just hoped everyone forgot about it and just continued as, as per normal but the fact that they're taking it seriously shows that they want to make the best of the last few months they have available or the last year they have available of running the club or year year less than a year or even more than a year sorry and they want to take it seriously going forward and they also want to include the local community in that as well so you can't hate this you know what i mean they're actually trying to implement changes they're actually trying to change things going forward they've got house rules code of conduct awareness team a new head of operations so hopefully going forward everything should be sorted and again maybe the security guys as well maybe kind of you know slow their roll a little bit as well because i heard some mad stories about the security but it continues the reason for the overhaul dates back to summer 2020 when the school announced its closure amid a backdrop of controversy. Though the reason given at the time was financial, the club had been widely criticised by members of the community for a lack of diversity in its staff and programming, as well as discriminatory instances um, involving security. I find it funny that Ari are reporting on these kind of things because some people would accuse Ari of the same, but we move! 
there was a huge need for a big dip um, to uncover the problems. Um, sorry, to dig deep and uncover the problems, to create structure for having painful but healing conversations and for creating an environment that of trust for our employees, visitors and artists, everyone else that is part of the space, said Kieran. That's a very crucial part of places. That's a very good indicator of a city that takes clubbing and nightlife seriously to the point where they're, they're willing to close down the space and kind of reset it and get it back going again. Not how you see other businesses where they say, under new management, they just change the fucking paint color or they change the fucking menu a little bit. These people are actually going at the root cause. They're doing a root and stem analysis and trying to basically build this club up again from the ground up and hopefully have it connect with the local community. This is something you have to get behind. It continues. The restructuring process took the, the form of more than 500 hours of conversation with more than 100 people from the community, including dancers, staff, former members and artists, former staff and artists many people were spoken to more than once the whole cataloging of a number of hours and time you've done things is a little bit weird and a little bit peculiar it's kind of like because you spent money on something it means it's going to be good it's going to be well done it's weird so kind of spend oh, i spent so much time in the studio it's going to be great it's not really true it kind of sounds like they're kind of pat, trying to pat themselves on the back but i get it it continues, we often started with a rightful anger towards us, sometimes ended in mutual respect and healing, says Kieran, a humbling process that taught us a lot. We don't think of that as a finished process at all. We are open to keep having these conversations. During the process, we started to feel that there are, there could be a new start for the club and they could add value to Amsterdam's nightlife. Personally, for me, there comes a point where talking has to stop. I know it's ironic for me because I ramble into a microphone to myself for the best part of a couple of hours every other day, but there there comes a time in these kind of issues where actions speak louder than words. I know for myself, from being at the clubbing scene here in the UK and London, we have many issues here concerning discrimination, especially in the centre of London or the east central bit of London from Brick Lane and kind of surrounding places and stuff where a lot of my brother's friends who are kind of like under the age of 26, when they go out in groups of 10 to nightclubs, they're not allowed in in groups of 10 as black boys because they're black. But groups of 10 white boys are going there and they're allowed in. The same goes for black girls. And it's a real big problem, right? They don't really, I don't know why they think black people are going to be more disruptive in clubs and white people. It's really bizarre. And those are issues that need to be addressed by the nightclubs. And I feel like a lot of those clubs will come out when they get cancelled or when someone records an instances or when they get discriminated at a club or someone posts a viral thread on Twitter or something. They'll get embarrassed and they'll make a big statement about it on Instagram or whatnot, but they won't actually put anything into action. There won't actually be no long lasting change. And that, me personally, I would much rather those glitzy nightclubs or those places, even like the school that have issues with discrimination and maybe not you know representation and stuff apart from putting out statements and committing to things just show and prove it by works and deeds i actually have have a lineup and a flyer out there and i can be able to tell oh wow you've got different faces on there it's not the same old people that play at awakenings oh wow you've got different people working here it's not the same old white faces i've seen all different venues like mix it up and actually showing me with actual works and deeds as opposed to statements and whatever that's what i want to see at the end of the day conversations are a good place to start it doesn't get in you somewhere but in the end conversations can get a bit tiring it can get a bit cumbersome and it can get a bit long so i like to hear them actually go ahead and do things it continues part of the restructure is a new creative team which will manage the programming according to kieran the three-dimensional focus will be art education as much as music with daytime events workshops and other educational projects planned during the day which i love i'm definitely going to be up for checking that out the school's restaurant and cafe which were which were never closed will continue to operate as usual the club will publish its code of conduct house rules and reflections on the past two um years uh, on its websites next week programming um info will follow in the coming weeks so this is the website. Hopefully we're going to get more information regarding this very, very soon. I can't wait for it going forward. It's going to be amazing to see that going forward, all the new information they're going to be putting out regarding um, the long finale they're going to be having together. And I'm really, really looking forward to it. I really am because it gives me an excuse to go to a nightclub that I've always been curious to check out with my own eyes. I have always been curious to check out with my own eyes. Anyway, that is the Action Zing Show episode number 591. I'm going to end the show there now. I keep, I keep touching my hair and I need to touch it because I just got it braided and I want it to stay in some level of shape before I head off to my holidays and stuff. And I'm happy I've got my head tight at least. I can now wear headphones normally. But I'm going to end the podcast there. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. If it's your first time, check out the podcast on 
this channel, then please make sure to click like and subscribe and shit if you want to come back and check out more stuff concerning myself. I also have a website online that is www.agassinozinga.com. You can check out all stuff concerning myself on there in terms of links concerning, you know, DJing, concerning um, my shop, concerning my podcast, concerning my Patreon. All that stuff can be found at agassinozinga.com available right now on your URL. Definitely make sure you check that out. But until next time, thanks so much for tuning in to the show. If you listen to the audio podcast, you hear a song. If you're just watching the video, yeah, unfortunately we'll just end it'll go black but thank you for checking me out it's been a pleasure peace out my friends peace out